We're going to be in the book of Acts this morning, Acts chapter 4. If you've been here for a length of time, you'll remember that, a significant length of time, you'll remember that uh, Stephen preached through the book of Luke, and it took him about two and a half years to get through the book of Luke, and Acts has four more chapters than Luke does. So I have no clue at what point we will finish this journey, Uh, but it's going to be a ride for sure. Acts is full of just incredible stories of the Spirit of God working through the Acts of the Apostles and through the church. And it will guide us in many ways into how we should think about ourselves as a community of faith and about our history, where we've come from, and of where we are going in light of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I I hope that you don't forget as we go through Acts that this is this is like a history book. This is this is Luke as a historian tracing the beginnings of Christianity at, when it was at its most grassroots moment. And, and if you think about the historical impact of what this is talking about from the beginning point, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, so I, I found a quote from, um, from a professor. Her name is Dana Robert. And uh, actually, I have a book by her. And she's the Truman Collins Professor of World Christianity and the History of Mission at Boston University. And she says this, The creation and expansion of Christianity began with Jesus, a devout Jewish man who lived, near, who lived 2,000 years ago, never left Palestine, had a public ministry of only three years, and was executed by Romans by the Roman authorities at age 33 by being nailed to a cross of wood in the manner of common criminals. Okay, think about this. This man in Palestine, three years of ministry, dies young, killed by the government as a criminal. And then the government officials hunted down and executed his most important followers. Yet, within three centuries of his death, an estimated 10% of people in the Roman Empire ordered their lives around communal memories of his life and teaching. Within three centuries, 10% of the Roman Empire, the biggest empire to exist to that day, lost my place. They devoted themselves to the communal memories of his life and teaching, faith in the defeat of death itself, and the affirmation that he was the Christ or Lord, the unique embodiment of the one true God. The transformation of a cowed and defeated handful of Jewish followers into a death-defying multicultural missionary community was an amazing beginning to what is now the largest religion in the world. I mean, the historical impact of what's going on here, this, I love how she puts it, the death-defying multicultural missionary activity, which has now resulted in the largest religion in the world. People, uh, 60% of Christians, that is those who would claim that title for themselves, 60% of them live in Africa and South America and, and within the Southern Hemisphere. It's a global Christianity. And it all started in these stories that we're reading right now. Peter and John have received the Holy Spirit. They're two apostles, and they're going to the synagogue to worship. On the way to worship, there's a lame man by the beautiful gate. He says, hey, can you give me some money? They say, actually, we don't have any money, but uh, we can definitely give you this. And they, in the name of Jesus Christ, heal the man. 
and he's leaping up and down, shouting for joy. Everyone is amazed at what is going on. They're astonished. Peter then gets the opportunity to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, who Jesus is. He is the Messiah that you've been waiting for. He is the Lord of the universe. Jesus is the one. He's the one your hearts have been longing for, and he's the heart, he's the one who every human heart longs for, whether they know it or not. He proclaims the gospel. Jesus has been raised by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the servant of Isaiah's prophecies. He is the holy and righteous one. He is the author of life. And Peter, in this time we explored last week, he invites his audience to repent and turn in faith to this Messiah. To respond to Jesus, either you receive him or you reject him. That's what we talked about last week. He draws a line in the sand. There is no middle ground here. You either follow Jesus or you have rejected him. And as as we read in Scripture, a half-hearted acceptance is rejection at its worst. (laughs) Right? Would that you are hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. A half-hearted acceptance of Jesus is still rejection. Jesus either wants all of you, or you have rejected him. Let's read what happens next in this story. Acts 4. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed... Because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas and the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what, the, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. So what we're going to see here is that the church is, an, is about to engage in their first signs of resistance. And it starts out with annoyance. <laughs> Look what it says in verse 2. It says, The Jewish leaders were greatly annoyed. 
these guys. They were annoyed because they were proclaiming the resurrection from the dead. Most of these leaders would have probably fit within that belief of the Sadducees who would be not believe in the resurrection. And so they're upset. It, it lists the high priestly family in verse 5. These, if you look at the names, these are the same people who crucified Jesus. The same high priestly family that was a part of Jesus' being sent to the cross. And you've got to be thinking, they're probably like, man, what, what is going on? We thought we took care of this guy. We thought we did away with this. Now his followers are at it. Proclaiming the resurrection from the dead. You know, they're trying, to, they're trying to snuff this out. So they arrest Peter and John, basically on a disturbing the peace charge. You guys are upsetting people. We're annoyed. <laughs> why, why, did they, why were they so resistant to what Peter and John were saying? And I think this is helpful to see. That the apostles' witness is for the Jewish leaders a power struggle for the hearts of the Jewish people. It's not that they have a problem with Peter and John saying things. It's that they are turning the hearts of the Jewish people away from their leadership and into the leadership of another person, namely Jesus. The resurrection is a problem for them, theologically. But then the practicality of what it's going to do to their leadership and to their power if people start submitting to Jesus Christ as opposed to their leadership. Because the apostles are claiming that Jesus is Messiah and Lord. If Jesus is Messiah and Lord, then the Jewish leaders, it's incumbent upon them to follow this Messiah and Lord. So they have to deny this lest they lose their status and their position. The Jewish leaders are quite happy with their ruling status and power plays. They would rather have power than submit to the ways of the kingdom of God as taught through Jesus Christ. The, you see this all through the story of Jesus. They're constantly upset at Jesus because he's teaching things that are completely upside down. He's not the Messiah they anticipated. He's coming with humility and gentleness and service and love. And that's not how they understood leadership. That's not how they understood the power of what would be the new kingdom coming in where they would rule and reign over all of their enemies. And the top dogs would be the right-hand men, like the disciples. Hey, can, we, can I sit on your right and your left, Jesus? Because we want to be in power with you. And Jesus is like, guys, my kingdom is not about power. Well, it is only insofar that Jesus alone has power. It's not about us achieving power, but of submitting to the creator of the universe, the author of life, in weakness and humility and lowliness. That didn't square well with the Pharisees, with the Sadducees, with the Jewish leaders. And, and just as a, as a brief aside, we, we've got to understand this as a church. This is a temptation for us as well. We must never let power be the motivating factor of our social and political involvement. Even if you think you or your party will use that power for good, we know from a long history that power corrupts. Mainly because there is only one who is truly worthy of it and who can actually handle it. Only Jesus is worthy of power and can handle power. As we seek to influence our social, cultural, and political institutions, let us always remember that we do so in humble submission to King Jesus and not to claim a right to a throne that we desire. Our influence is always in submission to Christ never to gain power for ourselves. 
the Jewish leaders didn't want to give up their claim on the hearts of the Jewish people. And if you look at verse 4, look what it says. It says that when people, many heard this witness of Peter in chapter 3, and they believed. And the number of Christians is now 5,000 households. <laughs> it was 3,000, now it's 5,000. This is not in a very long period of time. This is huge. Within Jerusalem itself, where we know from the book of Acts, the story is going to begin in Jerusalem, to Judea, and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Right now in Jerusalem, it has increased from being a small ragtag group of 120 people, now 5,000 households. The Spirit of God is at work. The people are believing the message of the apostles as they proclaim the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so these annoyed Jewish leaders arrest Peter and John. They can't deal with them now. They've got to wait till the next day. Maybe a, maybe a night in the clink will kind of, you know, get them, get them thinking right. And then they get to them together, and they are astonished at what happens next. Because the Jewish leaders are the scholars. They're the elitists. They're the ones that know what the Bible says. They understand the Old Testament scriptures. They are the masters of it. And yet they find that they are left without answers against the speech and the language of Peter and John. They say, by what power or by what name did you do this? And then Peter because he's such a masterful, skillful, gifted person, and no one else can do what Peter does because he's a special, unique individual who's got lots of skills. Too bad we're not, Peter. <laughs> that was all in the Bible there, verse 8. Oh, wait, no, I, I read that wrong. Sorry. Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Same Spirit. That indwells you, that indwells me. Said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. Okay, here goes Peter again, getting all bold on us. Addressing these Jewish leaders who were, had played a certain part in Jesus' crucifixion, he again accuses them of it in their face. And he declares very specifically, this healing was in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The means of the man's healing is the resurrected Jesus. And we've talked about that in the last couple weeks. That Jesus is a healer. That a part of his new creation coming into the present age as we wait for the full consummation of the future age. That there's an overlap and we already get to anticipate and experience the healing power of God now when he so chooses to give that gift. And so the means of this man's healing is the resur resurrected Jesus. But then look what he then goes on to say in verse 11. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, because they were the leaders there, he calls them the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The means of the man's healing is the resurrected Jesus, and the means of everyone's salvation is the resurrected Jesus. He says, first of all, Jesus is the cornerstone. That could also be translated headstone. We're not sure which one it is. Is it the cornerstone that kind of holds the, the, the foundation together? Or is it the headstone that kind of goes on the top as like the glorious cap on, on the beauty of what the temple would have had? But either way, it shows that it's of primary importance. It's the most important stone. 
He's playing on temple imagery here. And he declares himself to be the most important piece. In fact, in Luke chapter 20, Luke's already told us this. If you're Theophilus reading Luke's letters to you in both Luke and Acts, you've already read this. Jesus said in Luke 20 verse 17, He looked directly at them, that is the Jewish leaders, and he said to them, What then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. The stone does not leave you unchanged. You are either broken or you are crushed. And this is the stone that the builders, the the leaders, have rejected. The point is that the most important piece of this temple that these leaders were charged to oversee and care for is the very stone that they are refusing. They have rejected the one who is preeminent and holds all things together. And he uses Old Testament scripture and Jesus' teachings to make this point. Then... In verse 12, he makes this incredible statement in great boldness. There is no salvation in anyone else. In no one else. Jesus is the cornerstone. Jesus is the one Savior. That would make a good title for a church name. Just saying. I think it would work. Jesus is the one Savior. Notice the exclusivity of Jesus' name. He alone brings salvation. He alone brings peace. He alone is the rightful ruler of the world. He alone can redeem it, save it, and put it all back together again. This is exclusive. And this makes people in our current day and age very uncomfortable. It comes across as arrogant to claim to have the truth, making all other claims that are opposed to it false. And so what people have tried to do, is they've, they've tried to take away the exclusiveness of Jesus' claim to authority and to salvation. And they try to domesticate Jesus into a way in which we can adopt Jesus as one of our rulers, one of our gods, one of our masters, one of my lords, but not the Lord. Leslie Newbegin has written a lot about this. He was a missionary over in India. And in India, they worship Jesus. In fact, you, you go to India and you tell them about, I think Grayson's going to be going to India pretty soon here. You go to India from, from what I've read and you tell them about Jesus and they will gladly add Jesus to their list of gods. That's no problem. They, uh, he was over there and they would always, I think on Christmas, they would, they would stand before the image of Jesus in their temple And they would worship him, and um, that was his special day to be worshipped. But Jesus can't be added to your religious life. He's not an addition. He's a complete takeover. You can't add Jesus to your religious life. You also, you can't add Jesus to your reason and to your experience. Your rational understanding and to your experience. Because the two axioms or the two foundations of our modern day is it either has to be proven by scientific advances or it must be an experience that you can have with your five senses. Maybe allowing for some spiritual experiences in there a little bit. You've got to be able to prove it. And and, and if you can't prove it, that's okay. You can still believe it. Just as long as you call it a personal belief or a personal value, don't be so arrogant as to call your belief fact, because we know only science proves facts. 
Don't set up truth claims that would make competing ones false. Don't be so dogmatic. Or the word that's often thrown is fanatic. Let me read you a quote from Leslie Newbegin about the necessity of dogma in the Christian life. Dogma, that is this, this profound belief that is a fact of nature and of life and of history. However grievously the church may have distorted and misused the concept of dogma in the course of history, and it has indeed done so grievously, the reality which this word designated is present from the beginning and is intrinsic to the gospel. Something radically new has been given, something which cannot be derived from rational reflection on the experiences available to all people. It is a new fact to be receiving in faith as a gift of grace. And what is thus given claims to be the truth, not just a possible opinion. And it is the rock which must either become the foundation of all knowing and doing or else the stone on which one stumbles and falls to disaster. Those who, through no wit or wisdom or godliness of their own, have been entrusted with this message can in no way demonstrate its truth on the basis of some other alleged certainties. They only live by it and announce it. It is something given, dogma, calling for the ascent of faith. Here's the, here's the point. Our culture is trying to sell you the idea that your belief in Jesus Christ is a value. It's an opinion, and then science will be there to prove the facts. So if you ever have a belief that can't be proven by facts, that's okay just as long as you keep it to yourself. Don't announce it as truth. Don't announce it as the good news for all the world by which, and don't announce Jesus as the name by which no one else will find salvation except through him. Sometimes we won't believe in Jesus unless it's proven to be true. But then you're actually not treating Jesus as Lord, you're treating your own reason as Lord. You're treating your own experience as Lord. You're submitting Jesus to man's rationality, and that's idolatry. Some of us want to not just add Jesus to our religious life or let reason and experience be the receiving of Jesus as kind of like, this is the real God, but Jesus because we think it's true, we'll let you into that world. Sometimes we just want to add Jesus to our American life where we come to church and we say there is salvation and no one else, and yet we live our life as if money is our salvation and our security. We say there is salvation in no one else but Jesus, but yet we look to our family to give us salvation and safety and security. We live as if the government is somehow going to save us and secure us when we know that Jesus alone is the only way to salvation. The apostles are unique witnesses here. He's boldly proclaiming this truth, and it says in verse, let me get there, verse 13, that the leaders are astonished at his words. And they're like, how are these guys talking like this? How do they know that, that text about, from Isaiah about the stone that the builders rejected? How, do they, how are they doing this? And it says that when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, that doesn't just mean they didn't go to school or they were kind of like not as smart. That's talking specifically about the uneducatedness of their understanding of the Old Testament. They weren't the Jewish leaders. They weren't the scribes and the Pharisees who had spent their life studying the Torah and all the Old Testament texts. They were just fishermen. (laughs) They didn't get that training. How is it that they know all this? And it says, they recognized, I love this line, they recognized that they had been with Jesus. They recognized they had been with Jesus. In light of this, the Jewish leaders get very antagonistic. And they ask and they try to figure out what they're going to do. 
They can't deny the words they're saying. The man who was healed is standing right there with them. The, the proof is in the pudding, if I'm using that correctly. And so they say, okay, guys, come back. Stop proclaiming the gospel. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Whatever you guys say, we want to take the safe route. Peter and John could have done that. They, they could have responded to that, stop proclaiming the gospel, and they could have been like, oh, so if I proclaim the gospel, then my community is going to reject me. My family is going to reject me. I'm going to have to deal with some harsh realities. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be resisted. I'm going to have to face persecution even. I, okay, yeah, oh, well, let's, let's think about this one, John. Me and you need to have a little, you know, little huddle here. Are we going to actually, are we going to listen to them? If they had taken that approach, you would not have what you have today. Peter and John respond to this call of stop proclaiming the gospel. And here's what they say, verse 19. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. <laughs> For we cannot speak but what we have seen and heard. Basically, they responded to the Jewish leaders and said, I don't think so. You guys worship God. Should we listen to you or should we listen to God? We're going to listen to God. We're going to give an account to God. We're going to live our lives under the lordship and the rule of God, not of you. We cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Jesus is fact. His Death is fact. His resurrection is fact. And you cannot deny it. You can try all you want, but we will continue to proclaim it. Jesus is the Lord. There is no higher authority. No government or human institution can regulate our witness to the gospel. A Christian would rather go to the courts, to the prisons, even to death, than reject the call to bear witness to the truth of the gospel in a society that resists it. You read the stories of history. Many, many, many leaders and governments have tried to stop the proclamation of the gospel. They've tried to stop the advance of the Word of God, but Christians have found ways to sneak Bibles in against the law. To proclaim the gospel against the law. There is a law that exists beyond any human law, and that is this call of Jesus to his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations. Nothing stands in your way. That is the great command. That is the great mission. That's what we're called to. You're going to see in the book of Acts that the resistance is only going to get stronger. The persecution is only going to get more intense. And yet the Christians boldly move forward with the gospel and they die for it. We need to see this because I think that if we were living in a society that resisted the gospel with persecution and trial and resistance in a, in a physical way, I think actually you and I would actually do more evangelism. I think because we're in a free world in America here, which is a great gift but it's also a great tool of the enemy to deceive us into apathy and laziness. We have good news to proclaim. We have neighbors and co-workers who do not know that there is only one way to salvation, and that is through Jesus Christ. 
And if you proclaim that, if you say that, even in the most kind disposition, the most gracious manner, you say it in love and compassion, which is how we're supposed to do evangelism. If you say with compassion and love, Jesus is the only way you can be saved, you will find resistance in your life. That is not a popular message right now. Nobody wants to hear that Jesus is the stone who you will either fall on and be broken or who will crush you. Nobody wants that message, but it is the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is a necessity of evangelism. We must announce the truth of the gospel, the fact of the gospel. We got to present it as a fact, not as just a possible opinion among many others. Hey, if you're interested, maybe you should check out Jesus. Leslie Newbigin said, in spite of the enthusiasm of many educational experts for encouraging their pupils to have an open mind and to make their own decisions about truth, a teacher who asks her class whether Paris is the capital of France or of Belgium will not appreciate the child who tells him that he has an open mind on the matter. If something is fact, then the disagreement is merely a smokescreen of apathy or rebellion. Our belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ as the only way to salvation will be heard, will be heard. Listen to this. Your belief in Jesus as the only way of salvation will be heard as arrogant and dogmatic in today's climate. Now, we need to watch out that the charge not be true. <laughs> Because I do know a lot of Christians who very arrogantly proclaim the gospel and they do a disservice to the humility and the gentleness and the lowliness that Jesus Christ is trying to present to the world, that he is presenting to the world through himself. But the statement itself, even with Jesus' disposition of love, will still be heard as arrogant. But we must not follow men but God. We must live in obedience to God, which means bold mission. The gospel is good news to be announced. It's a message. It's transformed your life. You've had the complete takeover of Jesus. You now no longer claim ownership over anything you have. Everything you have is Christ. If you're his child, he owns everything. And so we go out with this message of Jesus Christ is a good master. He is a good Lord. Come to him and he will give you rest. He will give you refreshment. He will give you satisfaction. He will give you salvation. He will give you a future and a hope. Jesus Christ, he's the only way to do this though. You have to lay everything in your life down and give everything over to him. Because he's Lord. Do we understand what it means for Jesus to be Lord? Over everything. If we can be a people who live like that and who announce that, who live in the gospel and announce the gospel, then we will be people who find resistance against us. We will be people who receive a raised eyebrow at our fanaticism. We will be a people who might even receive a raised fist. Most likely if that happens, it's because you weren't doing it very well. <laughs> Probably should check the humility, you know, thing again. But if you're in another country, then you're at risk of death for following Jesus Christ. There's a book called The Insanity of God, and the author traces the persecuted church in many different regions of the world through different communist regimes who were, proclaim who were trying to, you know, don't preach the gospel, don't pass out the Bibles, burning the Bibles and the Christian literature. He was working in a Muslim area 
and they couldn't plant a church there because they had four converts, and within months of their conversions, they were all dead. Because that society where they were was resistant to the gospel. It's exactly why, it's exactly what Jesus told us would happen. Right now, we live in the anomaly. Could you do that? Could you proclaim the gospel to an individual knowing that their receiving of Jesus Christ is going to lead to their death in the next few months? Have you done that? Have you responded to the gospel in such a way that you would be willing to die in the next couple months? You'd miss your children growing up. You'd miss your family. You'd, you'd miss the joys and the pleasures that our hearts long for in this world. But it doesn't really matter because that's not our life. Christ is our life. Maybe it's easy for us to exist in the extremes, but what if tomorrow God's calling you to die to yourself so that you actually show the forgiveness of Christ to that person that's hurt you or harmed you? What if the death to yourself, the submission to Jesus as Lord, means not serving money and your job in replacement of Jesus Christ? What does that mean for us? All of us have to ask that question in a different way. What does it mean for Christ to be Lord? And what does it mean for me to be Him to be Lord and me to be obedient to His call, which is to be on mission, which is to be living in the gospel and announcing the gospel to this lost world? Our free society is deceiving us into apathy and distraction. Our hearts are always going to want to go to the easy way unless we intentionally cultivate obedience to Christ, which will cause inconvenience and discomfort and lots of other challenges. But this is our mission. Jesus said, go and make disciples. And Peter and John are exemplifying this for us, and it's a bold witness, but it's a call that we have. Let me pray for us. Lord, would you... Stir us up as your people to live in the gospel, to live in the reality that you are Lord over us, that you own all of us, that you have completely taken over, and nothing is going to keep us from obedience to your name. And would you help us to see, Lord, that that obedience is the proclamation and announcement of the good news of the gospel. Would you help us to get the urgency of the gospel, Lord, that there is no other name, that anyone can find salvation, that it's not okay it shouldn't be okay with us that our neighbors and our co-workers maybe have never heard the exclusive claims of Jesus Christ over their lives. Help us to speak the truth with patience and love and compassion and gentleness. God, we need you. Fill us with your spirit. We are not capable of this on, your own, on our own. But as we water and plant, would you give growth? We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.